Um, hi everyone, I'm Carla and I am dialing in from Durban in South Africa. Um, I am deeply passionate about conservation and about travel and just very respectful for the land and um, being in nature. It's one of my deep passions. Um, yeah, I've just enjoyed uh, this journey that I'm going on with Journey Woman. Um, yeah, it's just wonderful to be getting to know you, Caroline, and just appreciating all the incredible work that you're doing for women in travel and for conservation. I know that you've spent time with the turtles. As you know me, um, yeah. get to know me, you'll know that I'm very deeply passionate about conservation, um, all things animals. So yeah, enjoying travel. Just great, well, grateful to be here on this webinar with you. Great. So we do want to thank the um, acknowledge that the land we are standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations and thank the first peoples of this territory mm -hmm. and other indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us so that we can continue our work today. And I agree, Carla, I think, I think conservation is so important. That's one of the things we want to talk about today uh, in great detail. We wanted to start with uh, a video that Carla has um, produced and it's about five minutes so you can just take a pause and relax and watch the video i think it will really set up the rest of this webinar quite nicely it'll just fly by and the first time i watched it i was in tears so i thought i would share it with you today as a way to introduce what we're going to be talking about and why it's so important I've always believed that being in nature reconnects you with your soul. The healing powers of the bush are remarkable. Out here, you find peace and clarity. Out here, your eyes are truly opened. I'm Carla Geyser and I'm deeply passionate about adventure travel, conservation and connecting people. I first started my nonprofit Blue Sky back in 2012, and I've been leading expeditions through Africa ever since. I like to call them journeys with purpose. There is something incredibly powerful about bringing people from all around the world together, all different ages, with diverse backgrounds, but they connected with a common purpose, raising funds and awareness for conservation. This connection, while immersed in the wonder of rugged Mama Africa, is where the true magic begins. The journeys are not just about exploring Africa's stunning landscapes. Together, we raise money for remarkable scientific research and conservation programs that are already taking place on the ground. And thanks to this, we have the unique privilege of getting up close and personal with some of Africa's most iconic and endangered species. <laughs> Elephant conservation has always been a major focus of mine. Whether it's helping elephant orphanages or sponsoring elephant collarings. But we're also lending a hand to help and protect other creatures, like the world's most traffic wild animals, pangolin. The experience of walking with a pangolin that has been released back into the wild after we've paid for a telemetry tracker so that it can be monitored to keep it safe is something that you will never forget. We've also sponsored tracking devices for vultures who have been rehabilitated after mass poisoning events, as well as donated towards a custom-made vulture ambulance with life-saving equipment to rescue poison vultures on site. Like so many of these moments experienced on these journeys, there's simply no words to describe the feeling of seeing these extraordinary birds being set free after they have recovered. 
The aim of every expedition is to invoke a sense of understanding of the role that we as humans play in preserving Africa's ecological balance. And then we get to go out and make a difference. So when this expedition came along, I thought how absolutely unique. You would never ever get an opportunity to go and visit all of these conservation organisations in Africa. You just wouldn't. But you'd never be able to do this whole um, flow through in so many different countries. That's just such a unique opportunity. When I found out about this opportunity, there was a deep calling in my spirit that um, I was meant to be here. And it was truly the most amazing thing I'd ever come across. This is the most incredible experience. These babies are so playful. It's coming, it's coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> We've had the most amazing amount of fun, um, lots of laughter, and it certainly is a journey I think that's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. As for our fearless leader, Carla Geza, she's an absolute inspiration. This is our place in the human race. And we won't stop dreaming. No, we won't stop dreaming. This is our Whether it's driving with the wind in your hair, putting your feet in the sand, your hands in the water, or just quietly standing a stone's throw away from a magnificent elephant that is snoring on the ground. After a journey with purpose, you'll never be the same. All you have to do is open your eyes. Your heart and soul will follow. Carla, tell us a bit about how you got started in this journey that you're on with wildlife conservation. How did it all begin? Um, I when I left school, um, it's been quite a, a a winding path my life. And when I left school, I felt like I was floating through life without a clear direction. And I've had many jobs and tried lots of things and hobbies and everything. When I was at school, I always used to tell my friends that I was going to go and join Greenpeace. And I was also going to go and travel with a guy called Kingsley Holgate. Kingsley is one of the most adventured um, South Africans. He's traveled the most, well, one of the most traveled uh, South Africans. And I eventually did get to travel with him and work with him. And he opened my eyes to Mama Africa. Um, but going back to about 2012, uh, there was a rally called the Putfoot Rally, and my friend Bronwyn, um, who's on the call here somewhere, um, her and I decided that we were going to go on this journey, and it was traveling into Africa through seven countries over 21 days, and it was a social rally, so it was a big party, but there was a huge conservation side to it as well, and it was at that same time that this was going on that I saw the first poaching incidents that occurred. Um, two rhinos were poached Tembi and uh, Tundi. And there was a video of Dr. William Folds, and he was sitting next to the carcass of one of the rhinos that's um, horn had been brutally hacked off. And he was just sobbing. And I don't know, it just stirred or awoke something inside me. And I decided that I couldn't just sit back and do nothing. So Bronnie and I decided we were gonna raise the most money. And, and back in those days, we raised 150,000 Rand just by selling t-shirts and doing dinners and we did a rocking the rhino you know concert and it was a lot of fun and all our friends got involved and i think it was my first glance of the power of purpose for me um it was just showed me that when people work together for a common cause or a common purpose that's when magical things start to happen um it was on the put foot rally in 2012 that i also met a guy called Diggs pasco um, he sadly passed on, but he was very passionate about elephants. I've always loved elephants because they just embody everything that's good about life and friends and family. 
and Diggs, I told him about a journey that I wanted to do from South Africa to Kenya, and I wanted to do it to raise money and awareness for elephants. And just suddenly all these incredible conservationists and adventurers and people started coming into my life. And I don't know if it was a calling or a sign or whatever it was. I just had this gut feel that I needed to do more. And so in 2016, I also started telling people about this big adventure that I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it, um, uh, obviously, as I said, for elephants. Through Diggs, I met Kingsley, who was one of my um, inspirations. And he told me, Bronnie and I went to go and visit him. And he said to me, Africa is ready for women. And I was like, yeah, okay. It doesn't, wasn't really what I wanted to hear. I wanted to go and travel with him. And it kind of just opened up doors. Doors just started opening up and people came into my life. And in 2016, we uh, led the most incredible journey called Elephants, um, the Elephant Ignite Expedition. And it was a group of ladies that traveled all the way from South Africa through 10 countries to Kenya. Um, we drove uh, 16,000 kilometers. I'm not sure what that is in miles. Um, and it was all about raising awareness and um, just funding for, for elephant conservation. And it was on that journey, it just showed me um, what was happening in Africa. And it was just another reminder that I wanted to get out there and do more. And it was just a, a constant I don't know that it was just so powerful, this group of ladies going on this journey. And I mean, people always used to think we had like a backup team and we were like, no, the only support system we had was <laughs> we <together."> are it. <laughs> oh, no, it was it. And they were like, well, what happens if you've got a tire? And we're like, well, we changed it. Like, you know, and it was just very powerful. And it just, like I say, it was, everything was just unfolding and it was just starting to give me purpose. And I just realized that, I don't know, I don't know if this, this feeling inside me, it was just like this feeling of wholeness, like, like it was what I was, was destined to do. So yeah, so that's probably where I found the purpose to do what I do. But I'm very blessed in saying that, that I started Blue Sky back in 2012. And, you know, I just, it's, it's, it's a calling or that's not really a job. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just enjoy what I do. I get to meet incredible women along the way. I'd go to travel to most amazing places and just raise money and awareness for conservation. So yeah, sometimes you've got to push yourself off those comfort zones. But yeah, that's probably how I found my purpose. <laughs> you uh, you talk about elephants, but I in that video, there was mention of pangolins and other, other animals um, that are endangered. What is the current state of wildlife conservation in South Africa? What's your... What do you think is urgent that we need to know about? Um, it's quite a complex situation, um, conservation in wildlife Af uh, uh, in Africa. Um, and it varies significant, significantly across the continent. But there are a lot of key points that are happening, good and bad. Um, Kingsley always says Africa is good at, and bad all at the same time. It's never boring. But... Um, there's some fantastic work being done in terms of conservation organizations doing remarkable work. Um, the black rhino population is, is increased over the last couple of years. There's also a lot of um, tree planting projects where they're trying to, you know, work with deforestation. Um, a lot of the wildlife reserve areas are doing um, dropping fences so that the animals have got larger space to roam. Um, and they also, these co conservation organizations are also doing corridors so that the animals, corridors, so you'll have like two wildlife areas and they're building these corridors in between so that the animals get to roam freely. Um, on the bad side of things, uh, obviously Africa is rich in minerals. So we got a lot of um, countries um, that are coming into Africa and sadly Africa is for sale. Um, so they come in and they take advantage of this. Uh, sadly, the people on the ground don't make the money, but these organizations make billions. Um, there's lots of threats to wildlife. Um, some of the major threats are habitat loss. So as the human population explodes, animals and humans are left competing for land, for food and for water. Um, 
There's urbanization, deforestation, as I spoke about earlier, poaching. Uh, there's the bushmeat poaching, whereby people are snaring animals. Um, I've just, uh, you know, there's a lot of, and then there's a lot of, they try and they st put out snares, um, but then they also catching a lot of, like for game, um, to either to eat or to sell. Um, the venison trade is, is worth quite a lot of money. But um, a lot of the animals like leopards and hyenas and elephant and lion are getting caught in these snares. Um, then there's also the wildlife poaching situation. Um, human wildlife conflict, that's another one. Um, as I say, the areas where you've got humans and animals living together, competing for land and food and water, um, it often involves conflict. Uh, which leads to maybe an elephant would go in and crop raid, which means they would go into a farmer who'd been working on his farm and looking after the crops for months at a time. And then over a night, a elephant herd would just go in and just flatten it and eat them because that's what they do. Um, they're opportunistic. And this often leads to retaliations where the villagers or the communities get angry because that's the source of income. So they retaliate and they either kill the animals or, you know, like lions, if they kill goats or anything. So there's a, there's a lot of that. Then there's a lot of, go, lots of going on good and bad. So yeah, yeah, yeah. quite a complex could situation. You, when I first heard of pangolins, it was just recently in the last two years. Could you explain what a pangolin is and what it's trafficked for? So pangolin is that funny little creature with scales. Um, looks like it's a little, uh, should be in the dinosaur era. They walk on their back legs and they've got little hands they've got scales and sadly in a lot of the asian countries they are being uh poached it's the actually the most poached animal in the um in in, in the wildlife trade and they poached for they use it for pangolin soup so mm -hmm. they yeah they kill them to put it in food so which is not great um yeah but they the most incredible little creatures they're harmless when they get scared, they like cur like curl into a ball. Like an armadillo ball. almost. Yeah. Yeah, like, exactly like an armadillo, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so that's what they are. But they sadly, it's the most trafficked animal in in the in the world at the moment. And sadly, the wildlife trade is a billion dollar industry. Um it's right up there, it's the same syndicates as human trafficking, as illegal weapons. So it's it's not going away soon. So yeah, we've got to do try and do our little bit to try and support these organizations and protect these wildlife and just tell their stories um, out there to the world. Yeah. The other thing that I didn't know about until I met you was elephant collaring. Could you yeah. explain what that is? So elephant collaring, you saw in the video, um, there's a it's like a GPS tracking unit. Um, it's quite a big, it's probably about that big, and it's a collar that goes around the neck. And these, um, the wildlife conservationists use it to track and monitor elephant populations. So as I said earlier, elephants can be very naughty and they're opportunistic. So often they need to, um, the, the, the researchers need to um, gather crucial data, you know, where the elephants are moving, uh, their behavior, they can study their behavior and their habitat use. Um, and the information that they gather, because they get to, like through a GPS tracking unit, um, it downloads information and they can see when an elephant's like leaving the national park and going towards a community. And then they'll send like a rapid response team to try and herd them back um, just to prevent the human wildlife conflict. But um, the information that they gather, it's scientific and it's it's very important, it's vital because it helps them understand that the challenges that the elephants are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, um, such as poaching, uh, also habitat loss, and also just to help them develop strategies to help protect these elephants. So uh, mm -hmm. I've done a couple of elephant collarings. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a thing, as I say, when you have a five-ton animal snoring, they do snore. <laughs> next to you <laughs> um and it's just it's a very emotional thing seeing this ma you know this magical huge massive animal so vulnerable on the floor 
Um, but understanding that you, they're doing it to protect them in the long run is, is, is quite a thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. Why do we love animals so much? I mean, I felt I, you we mentioned can. turtles. I just did turtle <laughs> releases in Costa Rica and I was like watching these little uh, turtles and you think how courageous these small baby animals are. They're just going off into the ocean and only one of a thousand is going to make it. So, yeah. I always say that um, whenever you think you're having a bad day, just thank your lucky stars that you're not a turtle because mm -hmm. like you say, Caroline, the, the incredible courage that those little animals and they're tiny and their little fins, what they've got is what they've got to go through to, to survive. It's, it's, yeah, it's quite yeah. a story. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about some of the trips that you're, that you have and what you do on those trips and what the experience is like. Sure. Um, I've got a, I'm going to just try and see if I can do this without losing you. <laughs> um, I've got a little short little presentation. Um, where have you gone? Okay, there you are. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So, um, from these journeys with uh, that I did my expeditions, the Elephant at Night expedition, and then I did another one called the Rise of the Matriarch um, in 2018, I just realized that there was a huge group or, I don't know, what you call it, a society of females, uh, female travelers out there that wanted to do more. And the more I learned and the more I went out there and I met these incredible women, I just realized that there was this calling for women wanting to get out there and do more for conservation. So this led me to start these, uh, what I now call journeys with purpose. So next year, I've got a couple that I've, I'm starting, oh, well, I'm planning. Um, and it's all about gathering your friends. Um, I like to call Africa, Mama Africa. Uh, she's waiting for you. It's about exploring the stunning, the stunning landscapes. We go to some of the most magnificent places on earth. Um, they're small groups with with women of women, um, and we get to experience the healing powers of nature. There's a huge conversation going on at the moment about how people just seem to um, to heal in nature. Um, there's nothing like taking your shoes off and just standing barefoot in the sand or on the grass. I don't know. It just allows you to breathe. We're living in a society that's so anxious and dark and the world is angry at the moment. So to be able to go and just quietly sit out in nature or sit around a campfire uh, around uh, with a group of like-minded females, it's very powerful. And then also just to ignite um, fire. Um, a lot of us, as I say, over the last couple of years, the last few COVID years, there's a fire that seems to have gone out. So a lot of my journeys are with uh, are all about reigniting that fire within you. Um so the first one that I've got is, I've called it the Kingdom of the Sky. It's going to be Lesotho and South Africa. And the focus on that one is, once again, vultures. I'm very passionate about vultures um, and conservation. We are heading to the Southern Drakensberg, where we'll be doing some vulture work um, the uh, with Wildlife Act. Then it heads, we head up the Sani Pass, uh, which is a four by four route and it's up into the Drakensberg Mountains. And we go into a place called Lesotho, which is known as the Kingdom of the Sky. And it's got the most magnificent, big, open skies. And um, yeah, we'll be spending a couple of days there. And then we head towards further north to the border of South Africa versus Botswana. And um, there's an organization called Working with Wildlife that are doing phenomenal work up there in terms of conservation. So that will be where we'll spend the last couple of days just doing whatever conservation work they need us to do. Um, lots of scar stargazing, dusty roads, uh, roaring campfires, belly laughs, all that kind of vibe. Um, the next one, we head to Botswana, um, where we will fly into Maun and then head straight to the central Kalahari. Um, I've got a deep passion for Bushmen. Um, I think their connection to nature is something that we can learn from. 
Um, we will spend a couple of days there just meeting some of the, the sand bushmen, just seeing how they are connected to the earth. Um, we then go into the Okavanga Delta area where we'll be doing Makoro trips. Um, it's very, it's quite rustic this one. Uh, there are bucket showers and there's no Wi-Fi, so it's a bit of a digital detox. It's my favorite place to go in the world where there's no, no connection to the outside world. Um, and then from there, we fly to the Kwai Conception, which is right next to Maremi Game Reserve, where we will be doing um, game drives and just, you know, mm -hmm. looking for the big five and just, you know, enjoying ourselves in nature. And then there, for that one, there is an add-on that we can add, uh, go to Victoria Falls as well. Um, the next trip, I've called it Chasing Waterfalls. It's in, based in Zambia. Zambia has got some of the most magnificent waterfalls. Um, this is a photography-focused um, trip, and we will be starting in Lusaka, making our way all the way up um, to uh, Lake Tanganyika, uh, just looking at different waterfalls along the way. I've partnered or co-hosted with a lady called uh, Fiona McLean. She is a landscape and nature photographer, so she's going to be um, helping with that side of things. And that is in June, end of June. So it is hit, hitting the, the winter months, but there'll still be water. Um, we then get to explore, uh, explore Lake Tanganyika for a few days. And then we fly down via Lusaka to South Luangwa, which is very popular with wildlife um, there, um, where we'll be doing game drives and just exploring around. And this particular trip, we'll be raising money for Conservation South Luangwa. Um, I first met them in 2016 when we were working our way up Africa. Um, so that one's also going to be a wonderful one. And then finishing in Victoria Falls, um, which is obviously in Zimbabwe. The next one is Gorillas and Chimps, which is in Rwanda. Um, yeah, so we'll fly into Kigali, head towards the um, Nyongwe Forest, uh, where we'll be popping over into the DRC to go um, and to the Biega National Park looking for gorillas. We then go to Akagera National Park. Akagera and Nyongwe National Park are both run by African parks. Um, they are one of the most incredible organizations that are doing such wonderful work for preserving wildlife areas. Um, and Akagera is one of the, the national parks in Rwanda where they've recently, I think it was about two or three years ago, they um, just transferred a lot of rhino from South Africa. So the Ru Rwandans are doing phenomenal work in terms of conservation. Um, next one I've called Earth Awakenings. Uh, that's South Africa and Botswana. I'm also co-hosting this with a lady called Camilla Norman. Um, we'll start in South Africa, making our way through to the Limpopo River, which is on the border between South Africa and Botswana. We'll then uh, we'll do some vital conservation work there for vultures with Endangered Wildlife um, Trust. And um, we then cross over into the Tuli Block, which is in Botswana. Uh, one of my dear friends, um, Isabel, and her husband have got the most beautiful camp there. Um, so we'll spend a couple of days there. Um, just they've got the most a wonderful hide it's like where you can go underground and it's like a watering hole and you just need you don't even need to leave the camp because there's so many elephants in that bear and it's just wonderful just to sit there and just enjoy um, enjoy the nature around you uh, we then cross back into the Kruger the national park I don't know if any of you have heard about that it's a UNESCO world heritage site and yeah that's going to be just an incredible journey as well raising money for Endangered Wildlife Trust. Um, Aqua Earth, this is one that I've called, well, Aqua Earth, it's starting in Kasani, which is in Botswana. We will be on the banks of the Chobe River. Um, it's just a, another wonderful way to, to um, be able to view wildlife is on the on, on a boat. Um, we then cross over into the, uh, sorry, we'll be spending time with um, Elephants Without Borders. They do very amazing work. Well, they do a lot of amazing work for elephant conservation. They've got a little elephant orphanage there as well for um, little baby elephants that whose moms have been a victim of poaching. 
or other um, conservation. Um, they sometimes they they might get stuck in the mud or something, and the herd can't get them out, and then they leave them. So yeah, there's some. So the elephants without borders are doing fantastic work. We then head into the Caprivi strip. Um, this is quite a off the beaten track trip. Um, the Caprivi is like a thin strip that runs um, on the top of 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 Botswana into it's actually in Namibia, but it's this tiny this thin strip. And um, so they will be doing a lot of camping um, once again off the beaten track. Uh, a lot of digital detox there, no Wi-Fi. Um, going to Cardamon National Park, which is, um, yeah, it's not a very touristy place. I always like to choose the places that aren't over uh, overcrowded. Um, and then just, yeah, going down and finishing. That one finishes in Vintuk. Um, will be, there's a, a crew that I've, I've, I'm working with called Unbounded or Bajani. And they come and set up your camp for you. Uh, they do all the cooking. Um, so we just get to sit around and enjoy a glass of wine or a gin and tonic or whatever it is and nature calling around us and a roaring campfire. Um, yeah, and then the last one is called Desert Fire, which is based in, in Namibia. It's a 14-day trip. Uh, starts in Vintok. We go all the way down to um, Luderitz or Us, uh, looking for the wild horses. There's a ghost town there, which has been deserted. I don't know if there's any photographers out there, but there's some quite a lot of popular um, photo shots of, of the ghost, well, the town, which has been, as I say, deserted. We then head up to Sossesvlei to climb the dunes, um, the red sand dunes, which um, I'm sure most of you have heard of about, or and then heading to Swakopmund, um, and then we'll be doing some work with Elephant e Era or Elephant Human Relationships Aid. They are protecting and studying the desert elephants in that area. Uh, we'll probably go to a school. Um, I've got some wildlife conservation booklets that um, I've been doing over the last couple of years. And I'm going to be reprinting them next year. They just uh, basically, when we go into rural schools, um, handing them out to the children in these wildlife areas that are adjacent to these um, to these national parks because we need to get into the hearts and minds of the children as well. So, um, yeah, that's my wildlife, little wonderful wildlife activity book. Um, and then, yeah, heading off to uh, Etosha National Park, which is very nice uh, popular, and then finishing in Vintok. Um, and then the the latest thing that um, I've, I think I spoke to you briefly about it, Caroline, is I want to start doing celebration journeys. Um, I've just come back from Tanzania. I've spent three wonderful months at a magnificent place called uh, Singita in the Serengeti, uh, Sasakwa Lodge. And I've seen more and more of these groups of women just traveling as a, a miles, for a milestone birthday or just a friendship, um, just celebrating their friendships. And so if anyone is interested, got a bunch of friends or sisters or daughters or cousins or anything, um, I'm looking into doing custom-made uh, trips, obviously for always focusing on a conservation project and raising money for that, but then also taking these groups to wonderful places. So yeah, so that's basically that, yeah, my trips for next year. <laughs> I think uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I'd be curious what others think. I think I'd just like to come live in your backpack for the whole year. <laughs> no <everywhere. problem. laughs> You're welcome. I And I will even admit, I just texted my daughter a picture of a couple of these and said, what do you think? So, <laughs> because I think I think what's special about your trips is is the idea of the traveling with purpose, especially with you being a nonprofit. And I think that it has a different um, tenor, right? When you're you're working with nonprofits and you're there, you know, you're experiencing the culture in, perhaps in a different way. Yeah, and I think it's 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 so important for tra as travelers. Um, you know, anyone can go on a journey, but there's so many organizations out there that need our help. And as lady, as female travelers, we've got the power to tell the stories of these incredible conservationists that are on the you know they're on the in the firing line every single day protecting our wildlife and 
We need to try and support them and tell their stories in whatever form or, or, or whatever, however we can. And um, so, yeah, that's why I always try and I call them journeys with purpose because there's something very powerful, like I said in the video, um, when you get women from all different backgrounds, different ages, when they're connected by a common purpose, it's it's very powerful and magical things start to happen. Um, so yeah, that it, it inspires me. It, uh, it it motivates me to go out and do more. And yeah, as I say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, there's Next. a few questions here that we'll just we'll try to answer. Um, I mean, one of my questions was when's the best time to go, but I think you've already you're kind of outlining that already for us with some of some of the trips. Um, yeah. And uh, but you know how far ahead should should we be planning trips like this? It feels. It feels like a long journey, but it's not that complicated to get to Africa anymore, is it? No, do you know what? And also, um, time is just whipping past. I mean, we're at the end of this year already. Mm -hmm. And just being in a lodge environment and, and just chatting to to fellow travelers and, and tour operators, um, there's been such a change in the market. And I think people have realized that we're not going to be here forever and there's so much uncertainty and anger and, and the world is a funny place at the moment and when you've got something like a healing like nature it does heal you it, it allows you to breathe again and you know what there's you know there's different wars going on and there are different viruses you know pitch, you know popping up and i think of anything we've learned learned in the last couple of years through covid that you know there's no right time to to try and plan a trip. You've just got to dream of doing something and then just go for it and find a way. Um, like when I started Blue Sky back in 2012, I didn't have a business plan. I didn't have a cent to my name, but I just knew that I needed to do something. So I travel like that. I don't have um, you know, many rands or dollars in my bank account, but I don't know. I just find a way. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think when you driven by purpose, it, it allows you to, to find a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any questions anybody would like to ask? Um, okay. There's a question here about older women on the trips and safety, I guess safety would be a, a question. Yeah. So um, I belong to South African tourism association and we constantly updated with, with things going on. When I did my big trip in 2016, we um, security is always a huge priority for me. Um, I know it takes you guys quite a long, I think it takes you two days to get to Africa. Is it 48 hours or something to fly? So I know it's a long way for you to get here. But yeah, security is always, is, is always a priority. I'm always talking to people on the ground in the different countries. I'm working with different um, tour operators, trying to support local you know, there's nothing like local knowledge. They know exactly what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've had people 21. I've had people 78. So mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, you, you're ever too old to to do anything. I think it just depends on the person. What about uh, physical shape? Is it is is it strenuous? Is there, how would you describe Some of that? them are more, yeah, some of them like the chasing waterfall. Um, I think there'll be a lot of hiking to the waterfalls. So, I mean, that one would, you'd probably be, need to be a little bit more fit. Um, but a lot of this time, it's you just sitting in a game drive vehicle. Um, a lot of the activities aren't compulsory. So if you feel like just sitting at the camp and journaling, a lot of the camps have got beautiful watering holes where you can just sit and enjoy the, enjoy the facilities. Um, a lot of what I do, as I said, um, I do like to go off the beaten track. Um, which means that, uh, you know, there's a lot of over tourism at the moment. So I like to try and find the places where, where there's not too much, not too many people, but it's always in a safe environment. And I've always got contacts on the ground. Um, I am, I've got Satib insurance. They on call 24 seven for like, if there's an emergency. So yeah, you know, you can stay at home and something can happen to you or you can, you know, you never know what's going to happen in, in yeah. life. Yeah. So there's medical, medical support nearby. Yeah. 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 Um, what about food and allergies and 
So all of that's possible, just depends on dietaries. Um, oh, so people, if they come on the trips, I uh, always ask them what their dietary requirements are. I've had a lot of vegans, um, you know, lactose intolerant, gluten, you know, all the whole smorgans board. So as long as people give us notice, um, you know, we can, you know, chat to the, the, the camps on the ground and just make sure that they um have the right facilities i always do if we're driving i always am one of the drivers i'm the front and the lead vehicle um and i always make sure that if somebody is say for example vegan or something or lactose that i've got i'll, I'll buy food in but i'm trying to do more and more support you know local the lodges that have got people that can do the cooking or um that so that we can just sit and relax and enjoy and watch life as it goes yeah. by. There's a question here about how the money supports the local organizations that you're working with. Could you explain that yeah. a little? So all of the organizations, I've been working with a lot of them for about the last 10 years. So um, I will, I normally charge like, a, depends on the trip, but it's normally like an ex, about a thousand dollars of of what I do goes towards uh, raising funds for those conservation groups. And, and transparency so the rest of the costs go towards the logistics vehicle hire fuel uh, accommodation but it's normally about a thousand dollars that goes to, depending on the trip that goes towards the conservation projects so if we coloring an elephant um, that will go towards the veterinary fees the medical fees for the the darting um, and then obviously the collar itself or the telemetry sets for the tracking devices on the pangolins they all cost money. Um, veterinary costs are always expensive, but it allows us the opportunity to go in there, to meet the conservationists, to see the incredible work that they're doing, to hear about the stories, the successes. Um, yeah, it's just it's just an interesting way of doing things. What what would a typical day be like? I mean, if you were to pick one of your trips. Um, so say for example, we were going in Botswana, we would normally go on a game drive in the morning, you wake up, you have your coffee, uh, go out on a game drive, uh, come back, or if we're doing conservation that morning, so one of the trips this year, we were doing some vulture work, so we woke up in the morning, we had our breakfast, um, we went out, um, we had to, obviously it's not a, a zoo, so sometimes you've got to wait for the vultures, so um, they, they um, do sacrifice an impala. So they will put the impala there and then you've got to sit and around and wait. So sometimes patience is, is needed because um, it might take an hour. It might take a couple of, might take a day. You know, it's, it's, as I say, it's not a zoo. Um, and then we will talk to the conservationists. Um, I know a lot of them quite well. Um, so they'll tell us more about their projects and the work that they're doing. Then we'll go normally go home for lunch um, and then either go out and do an activity in the afternoon if it's a game drive or a hike or whatever, wherever we are, or you know, if it's a gorilla tracking or you know, it depends on on the trip and and where we are. Mm -hmm. Are these trips, do you find in your experience, better for some women than others? Or, or can anybody, you know, do this kind of I think of you've got to have a, a bit of an adventurous spirit and a sense of humor. Because um, traveling Africa is, you know, there's no spreadsheet that you can follow. Um, you can plan a trip. And I, I love logistics and I love the planning. But often you'll wake up in the morning and something would have happened. And then you've got to make a plan B or a plan C. But it's it's always about just being in the moment, having a sense of humor. Um, as I say, safety is always a priority. But um, yeah, we try, we do it in as, as best way as we possibly can. But um, it is any woman, as I say, I've had 21 year olds, I've had 76 year olds. Um, a lot of the ladies uh, have, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's varies from um, women that have lost their partners, their traveling partners, have always wanted to come to Africa, a little bit nervous of, of traveling on their own. And it's literally been one of the things that inspires me and motivates me is just seeing how different women from different backgrounds, they go on this incredible journey. And I've watched it time and time and time and time again, how people just 
I don't know. I don't know what it is in nature or if it's the group of women or just being out there. It's just seeing people breathe and people evolve. And I don't know, they, sometimes they go on these life-changing paths. Sometimes it just helps them connect with themselves. So yeah, that's that's what I try and do. But yeah, anyone is welcome. Um, just chat to me uh, beforehand so that I can try and manage expectations. Um, yeah, as I say, we do do a lot of driving. I am always one of the drivers. Um, I've normally got a second vehicle. Uh, one of uh, my crew members um, will drive the second vehicle or we will hire a driver and a vehicle that will take us through the areas. As I said, I'm trying to support more local, small opera um, operations um, just to try and support them. That's great. I just want to mention that... Um... The Carla will be with us on our 30th anniversary oh, trip right. <laughs> uh, to Norway. I'm just putting the link in the chat. And um, so we'll be on a Hertegruten ship. It is open to men and women, um, this trip. And um, and I think we're getting close to 40 people on this trip. But, um, but I think there might be still spaces available if any of you want to come and meet Carla in person uh, in just a few weeks. Uh, that's an opportunity as well. And we'll also have, for those in Toronto, uh, we will be having a booth at this year's women's show, which is a first ever for Journey Woman, but we thought it was a special time to do it with it being our 30th anniversary. So I'll have some of Carla's materials at the booth if you want to come and, and say hello. That's November 8th through 10th. And um, uh, and yeah, we're, we're here to answer any questions you have. And all of you on this call will be getting an email with all of the trip details and the prices and all of that. And you can contact Carla and Carla, I think you even have a special offer for booking as well. Yeah, we've got a $200 discount if you book before the first of, I think it was November. <laughs> I can't remember, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, just, yeah, just chat to me. Um, yeah, so that's specifically for Journey Women um, ladies. And yeah, just, as I say, the celebration journeys, if you've got something, any milestones, I'm open. Um, yeah, just chat to me. I love plotting and planning and going to new places. So yeah, just give us a call. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing this really inspirational vision of yours come to life. It's just amazing. There's nothing I love better than seeing women make their dreams happen. So congratulations and um i look forward to meeting you in a few weeks and um and hopefully we've inspired some of you if if not this trip just to get out there and explore the world and see what's waiting for you yeah thank you so much caroline and yeah just to each and every woman out there just yeah go out there and and just just do what i love travel it's, it's a wonderful thing and i think it's a big a huge educator um and yeah, as you say, Caroline, what you're doing for women and travel is phenomenal. And also really looking forward to, to spending time with you on the Hurti Gruten. And congratulations on your 30th um, year anniversary. As I Did say, you you're say 50th or 30th? 30th. <laughs> 30th. <laughs> Imagine 50. Oh, my gosh. I know. We'll still be going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, super. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us so much. And uh, I hope to see you in a couple of weeks at our 30th anniversary or wherever our paths cross. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.